Colonel said, all right, here's the address of my memory grant table. The Colonel knows that once and for all in the beginning. You can build an entry saying, for example, entry one says, the dish driver is allowed to write bytes 1400 to 1499, no other bytes. And the granularity is to the byte, not, not page or line or anything. So you can say, you have access to write the byte 28, and no other byte, like a status indicator or something. Okay? So what does the boss system do? It then passes an index, say one, to the dish driver saying, please go read a block and use memory grant number one in order to put the answer back. And the disk driver's got the block, calls the kernel and says, hey, go write this block to him and use memory grant one. And the disk driver, the kernel then checks the grant table, fetches grant one, sees yes, grant one says the disk driver is allowed to write the memory. And furthermore, it's allowed to write to bytes 1400 to 1499 and nothing else. If the disk driver is trying to write up to 100 bytes, it copies it to 1400 up to 1499 and then it's done. But the disk driver couldn't write any other address. In fact, it's got no way of even talking about it. All I can say is use memory, say, use memory grant 2 if it wanted to. So then the kernel will check and see that memory grant 2 isn't for the disk driver, so it can't do it. As soon as the file server has got its data and it's started again, the first thing it does is erases the memory grant, right? Zeros on it. So even the disk driver can't use it a second time. So it's good for one specific process to write for one specific buffer one time. Very, very limited compared to, to the usual scheme where a driver can write anywhere in memory whenever it wants to. So it's much more limited. Other advantages of user drivers, well, there's a short development cycle, you know, start the driver off, it crashes, you know, start it again. The normal programming model, you know, printf works, and you know, this core image, you should debuggers on it, it's the regular programming model, the way you use for well, ordinary processes. There's no downtime when you crash and you go, server dies, the rest of the system is running, you start with your debugger, see what's going on, so it's much easier. Uh, it's quite flexible, of course. You know, talk. Okay, I gotta tell this story to any computer science audience. Um, the, the one on the left is the The one on the left is the bird. You can identify with either one to do it. Um, suppose the devil offers you the spouse and the bargain. You know, I go give you twice the speed, twice the crashes. You know, the nerds say, um, Thank you, Mr. Devil. Thank you, Mr. Devil. <laughs> Ordinary users will never, ever accept that. I mean, they want it to work all the time. They don't care about speed. You know, I, I just argued with my wife over that um, it doesn't work. You know, so I go over there and I try to fix it. She says, why doesn't it work? And I said, well, you can put whatever software you want on the computer. She says, I don't want to put any software on the computer. I just want to use the software Dell gave me when I bought it. You know, don't they have a model where you can't change the software and just works all the time? And I said, no, Dell doesn't make a model like that. Why doesn't Dell make a model? Nobody would buy it. I would buy it. All my friends would buy it. Why don't they make a model where you can't change the software and it works all the time? And I said, nobody would buy it. You know? Most non-technical users just want it to work all the time. They don't care about, you know, speed and all that. doesn't matter. Um, so, nevertheless, we did, we did measure the system with all performance. Computer science audits jump all over me if I don't talk about performance. So, we measured Minix 3 against Minix 2, which is the same system, but with the drivers and stuff in the kernel and much less checking. So, GetPit is 22% slower, mostly because of all that checking and stuff, like the bitmaps and all, all stuff. So you look, you get it, well, it doesn't read one word out of the kernel. So all you see is overhead. But you know, for the other calls, like LC, it's only 11% of the, you know, there's a bit more work there. Uh, on the average, it's maybe a 12% hit, mostly due to the checking. Okay. Um, the disk performance. We measured the performance on, say, 1K disk block. What we found was that Minix is about, you know, 8 megabytes a second, and FreeBSD is about 12, and Linux is 16, so Linux is much better. However, at 16 megabytes a second, Linux is using a quarter of the disk. So, if you're using a 1K block, you know, you don't care about performance, because your disk is running maybe, you know, 20% of its actual performance speed. But don't give me a story that you care about performance, and you're running your disk at a quarter of its performance. Okay? If you want the disk to actually perform well, you need a block with at least 16K. And at 16K, all the systems are the same. You're limited by the speed of the disk. So, you know, um, if you ever install Minix and you pass up the CD-ROM to install it, um, then, uh, you know, when it asks you an initialization, uh, what size this block do you want to perform at this, say 16K, and then you get the full performance of the disk. Okay, application performance. Um, you know, one thing we did just a little bit old, just a little fine, but um, in my PC, if I try to build Minix from scratch, so it's the kernel, you know, the file server, the reincarnation server, the process manager, the drivers, whole thing, complete operating system, takes six seconds on my PC. I don't know how long the Linux build takes. Um, people have told me you cannot build Linux in six seconds. Um, so I can live with six seconds of complete build. It's 126 compilations, 
12 links, all thing, six items. Okay. I consider that acceptable performance. I don't give the highest performance. The full build in uh, six seconds. Okay. The positive test, you know, the difference between minix two and minix three was eight percent. Um, other people have looked at this. The, um, the guys, uh, the L4 guys, they made extensive measurements of L4 versus you know Linux and, and FreeBSD. And they find that if they really work on it, they can get the performance down, the performance penalty down to five ten percent. So the microprocessor design does have a performance penalty. The messages going back and forth, We're talking ten percent something. We didn't really try to tune it, it's not our thing. But other guys have shown uh, you can do that. Um, cost of driver recovery. Well, we simulated bugs in the driver by killing the driver every 10 seconds, every delta tick. So normally we can get about you know, uh, 88 megabits a second, I think, out of the fast Ethernet. We kill the driver once a second, performance stops by about 30%. Okay? If you have a driver that's crashing every single second, you know, you probably shouldn't be expecting really good performance. The Linux driver crashes, that's the end of the system. It stops. In our system, you get a 30% performance degradation. The driver dies every second. If it only dies once every 10 seconds, you don't even notice it. It's running at full speed, basically. So we can handle that easily. And the main reason of even this much is there's some timeout in the TCP IP protocol, I think, which uh, is getting to 60 milliseconds. So if you fix that timeout, you can make it behave better. But normally, the goal is you know, not to have really, really high performance, and it's crashing constantly. It's all repairing itself at a very high rate. The user doesn't even see this. Okay. Code size, um, you know, first column is, is the name of the part. Second one is the number of files, and the number of lines of C, number of lines of assembler, you know, how many semicolons, which is also a measure of how big it is, and binary size. So we're talking about 20,000 lines of code here. And the TCP IP stack is another 20,000 lines of code. So the whole thing, you know, all in all, with TCP IP is probably 40,000 lines of code. It's not that big. And much of it's running in user space. But a fair amount of that is part of the, the trusted computing base. Okay. The TCP IP, TCP IP stack is not part of the trusted computing base. If that fails, your networking dies, but the system doesn't die, it's a no more network. Fault injection experiments. Um, we ran an experiment where we injected uh, 2.4 million faults into um, three drivers. So we had the NE2100, the Realtek 8139, and the Intel Pro 100, we injected 800,000 faults into each driver as follows. Okay. It was done on the binary driver, so the running, running system, while it was actually running, used like slash dev slash kmem or you know, our equivalent of that, to actually change the drivers on the fly while the system was running. And we didn't do it at random. We made difficult changes. Like you take a single you know, Pentium instruction, we change the source address. So the instruction said, you know, move memory to EAX. And we change the memory address that is moving to EAX. That sort of simulates you meant to write i equals j, but you actually wrote i equals k. You know, so you've read the wrong value of something wrong. And we changed the destination address. We changed the loop condition. So it said branch less than or equal to. We made that branch less than. So it's like you know you're off by one, and the number of times the loop is executed. Those are very subtle and difficult errors. So we're not writing zeros over the code. We're doing things that are worse than that. We injected 100 faults in every experiment. We waited one second to see if the driver crashed. If the driver didn't crash, we did it again. We did it again. We did it again until it finally crashed. I mean, it doesn't crash every time. It's often the faults we've injected are code that's not being executed right now. Some special condition that didn't occur. So there's a fault in the code, we never hit it. So it doesn't matter. We just keep injecting faults often enough after you know 10 runs or 50 runs, it'll eventually cause it to crash. We observed um, altogether 18,000 crashes on this experiment. Okay. We killed the driver 18,000 times, but we never once crashed the operating system. We survived all 2.4 million fault injections. <coughs> so the system is extremely robust, even in the face of very heavy fault injection. We just killed the driver. The driver was restored automatically by the reincarnation server and used it in another sending. Okay. Now, a couple of other little things. A logo. Every operating system seems to be an animal. You know, Windows XP was Longhorn, and then you have Panthers, and you've got, you know, Tigers, you know, penguins, all this kind of an animal. So, we have an animal. Uh, it's a raccoon. Why a raccoon? Um, well, small. <laughs> it's cute. <laughs> very important. You don't have a war god or something. You know? um, it's very clever. I mean, it's, you know, it's very smart. They're agile. They're little fingers. Just like people. They can open garbage cans. They're very famous in, in North America for opening garbage cans and feeding them something. Um, they eat bugs. <laughs> <laughs> and they're probably more likely to visit your house than a kangaroo. <laughs> Well, 
these server systems are reliable. Um, we're trying to demonstrate you can put the drivers in user mode with a relatively small performance penalty, but it actually works even under aggressive fault injection. Um, that this certainly could be used for high reliability applications. And if people with Phelps, you know, say, you know, people buy these 3,000 euro giant TVs, you know, and people with Phelps say, you know, if it crashes, um,